We're in Colossians chapter 1. We're going to be in verse 11 today, but um, it's kind of sandwiched in this section between 9 and 13, um, where Paul's telling the Colossian believers the things that he's been praying for them. He says that he's been praying for them that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that they can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and fully please him. And then he says this is what that looks like, you know, bearing fruit in every good work, um, growing, increasing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. And then he says, giving thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Um, he says he's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, okay? Um, <clears throat> but I wanna stay on this little verse in verse 11. Um, where he says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. What does that mean? You know, when I first was reading through this section, I was kind of like, okay, um, bearing fruit in every good work. Okay, I get that. Um, growing in the knowledge of God, becoming mature, you know, in Christ. And um, and then and then I hit this one. I'm like, okay, cool. This is this one's cool, right? This is where the power is, right? We're we're gonna get the power right now, and not just any power, like all the power. And, and it's not just anyone's power; it's His power, right? And I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, you know, spiritual gifts, um, healing, um, gifts of faith, uh, miracles. We're going to uh, have some prophecy, um, you know, some cool stuff's going to happen right now. But is that what this verse is saying? Um, no, the answer is no. I mean, he tells us right here why he's going to strengthen us. Why does God strengthen us? Well, he strengthens us with all power according to his glorious might for endurance and patience with joy. Look at that and you're kind of like, eh, that's actually not sounding as good, right? Um, because it sounds like what he's saying is that we're going to have to endure some stuff and be patient. Um, and, and from what I understand, like enduring something, when you endure something, <clears throat> it's not necessarily like a good thing, right? Not something that you want to go through. When you endure something, usually it's something hard, usually something painful, um, some kind of trial, uh, something that's difficult. And, and and then if you're having to be patient, um, if you have to be patient, that means you're not getting what you want. Like maybe you're not getting all the things that you're hoping and you're praying for <clears throat> like right now. And so you have to wait for those things, right? And and, and I think that um, this is a hard concept for us uh, in the church. Um, and I don't know if it's like an American church thing, a Western church thing, or if it's just humans in general. Um, but we sort of, um, have this expectation that everything's supposed to go our way and that we're supposed to get the things that we want. But the Bible keeps telling us over and over again, um, not just in the New Testament, but yeah, all over the whole New Testament and also in the Old, um, that we're going to go through some hard things, right? And we see the examples of the people that are in those stories, that they all went through hard things too, right? And if, and if God's strengthening us with all power, according to his glorious might, um, for all endurance and patience with joy, it probably means we're going to have to face some hard times on this earth and that we're not always going to get everything we want, at least not when we want it, <clears throat> at least not in this life, right? I mean, the things that we do desire and that we hope for, um, the things that we feel like, man, this is just wrong, you know, on this earth, um, those are the things that are actually, we're going to actually get and receive and um, experience the fullness of in the new heaven and the new earth. Um, that's the eternal state, you know? And I, and I don't wanna overplay this, like there are good things that we experience on this earth, right? The life, life is not all bad. I mean, um, every good and perfect gift does come from above, from the father of lights. Um, and, and so he does give us good things. We have our families, you know, some of us are married, we have children. Um, there's a lot of joy in all of that. Um, he does provide for us and we have the things that we need. Um, you know, um, you know, in America, we're super blessed. Like we kind of live this life of luxury, you know, in America where, um, if you feel like a coffee, like at any point you can just stop driving and pull your car to the side of the road and there's going to be a Starbucks right there, you know? And, um, we, we have what we want information at our fingertips and we expect just to receive. And maybe that's why we buck so hard against this 
concept that we have to be patient and that we have to endure. I mean, it, 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 it could be that, that we're just so spoiled rotten that we don't want to hear it. Um, it could be that we've, you know, the, the prosperity preachers have told us that everything from the eternal kingdom that God has promised for heaven is, is actually we're supposed to receive it right now. You know, and so we expect it. We're like, what's up? Why am I not getting it, God? Like, you're not being fair to me. Okay. But, but the point is that's that the Bible teaches um, that we're going to have to go through hard things. And sometimes we get bitter and angry because we don't want that. We expect it right now. We're kind of entitled. Like, give me, give me my blessings, God, like you promised. Well, actually, what he promised is in this world, um, you're going to have tribulation. But he said, take heart because I've overcome the world. Okay? Jesus actually told his disciples, um, if anyone wants to come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Okay, But where was Jesus going when he picked up his cross? Well, he was going to Calvary. Right? He was going to death. Hey, follow me to Calvary. Follow me to death. Right? We don't want to hear this, right? Um, of course, we're all going to die, you know, but, but what this means is that we have to die to ourselves. We have to die to what we want, to our desires, to our dreams, our hopes, our vision for our life, because our life belongs to Christ. And, and we're not living for ourselves anymore. You know, Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. He prayed three times and asked the Father, Lord, if, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And what did the Father do? Well, he loved him and he comforted him and he strengthened him and he let him go to the cross. And Jesus, living his life for the will of the Father, obediently went to the cross. He, en he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. You know, Peter tells, tells the, in his epistle, he says, Don't be surprised, my brothers, at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, so that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. James Told the church my brothers count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience but let patience have its perfect work so that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing we're going to suffer in this world okay but 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 we're not living for this world we're living for the world that is to come we're not living for ourselves. We're, li we're, we're not living for getting everything we want and accumulating this giant mountain of stuff on this world when God already told us it's all going to burn. We're supposed to be living for Christ and for his eternal purposes for this world and for all the people around us that he died to save. And this is what it means to bear fruit in every good work. That, that through the trials, through the ups and downs of life, that love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control are being manifested through our lives as we walk in all the good works that God's prepared beforehand, that we should walk in, in them, in the lives of the people that are around us, that they might see Christ in us and long for that eternal um, salvation that we've received as well. Um, this is what increasing in the knowledge of God, growing up in him, becoming mature believers, that, that we would know him, that we'd be able to better reflect him to the world around us, and that we might be more effective for his, in his mission for us on this earth. We're being strengthened by him with all power, according to his glorious might, so that we can endure the trials and tribulations of this life and patiently wait for the promise of his coming. And we're supposed to do it all with joy, right? Joyfully, joy joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. As we're walking in all this stuff, we're, 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 we're being, joy is being expressed through us, right? And then he says, giving thanks to the Father for what? Well, because he's qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Right? And what's that mean? What is that inheritance? Well, it's the eternal kingdom. It's He's our inheritance. He's going to return and he's going to glorify us together with him, make us perfect and establish a new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells. Okay, And that's the kingdom that we're living for. 
that's our inheritance. That's the eternal kingdom. That's where all the promises are fulfilled. Eternal life in the presence of God himself and his eternal kingdom. The new heaven and the new earth where there's no more pain and there's no more tears and there's perfect peace and there's no more toil by the sweat of our brow and there's no more violence and we have perfect contentment and we dwell in perfect love. That's the kingdom we're living for. That's the world we're living for. And we're to live this life in this world with endurance and patience and joy with our eyes fixed on that world. This is the hope laid us for, up for us in heaven. That's what he talked about in verse 4 of this same chapter, right? You have a hope laid up for us in heaven. It's Jesus Christ, his return, longing for his return. Okay? In Philippians, Paul kind of expresses this sentiment in, in chapter 3 in verse 7. Well, he's talking about actually his former life in Judaism and all of his achievements as a Pharisee, his success, the upward trajectory of his career and, and all the things he was accomplishing. And then in verse seven, he says this, but whatever gain I had, I counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. And then down further on, he says that I may know him, okay? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection okay? and the share in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, taking up my cross daily, denying myself, following after him, that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Okay, so this is Paul just expressing that. I wanna, I wanna know Christ and, and the things of this world just, they're, I don't care about the things of the world. They don't compare to simply just knowing Christ. And I'm gonna live my life for him, how he's called me to live it in the power of his resurrection. I'm gonna live in that power of his resurrected life. Though I'm dying to myself outwardly, though I'm dying to my desires, I'm dying to my affections, I'm dying to my desire for achievements and glory and fame and whatever fulfillment I'm looking for in this earth. I'm dying to all that, but I'm living in the power of his resurrection and I'm sharing in his sufferings and becoming more like him in his death, right? I'm not living for myself. I'm living for the people. I'm living for his purposes on behalf of the people that are around me, that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. What's the resurrection of the dead? The day when Christ returns and he, he catches us all to meet him, glorifies us together with him and ushers in his eternal kingdom. Amen. And then Jesus also in, in Hebrews chapter 11, the writer of the Hebrews is telling us about, you know, Abraham and all these Old Testament saints who have um, endured and, and been patient looking for the promise. They endured all the hard things that they had to walk through while patiently looking for the kingdom that was to come. Okay, and he goes through this whole chapter of all these saints and the um, crazy things they endured and how they patiently waited and they looked to the promise despite the fact that they didn't have Pentecost. And they didn't have the infilling of the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the advantage of looking back and seeing, oh, that's what all the promises meant. That's what the prophets were talking about. Um, Christ and how he was going to come and live and pay the penalty for our sins and he was going to make a way for us to be reconciled to God. They didn't have all that, but yet they still endured and yet they were still patient and they still looked to the promise right and, and they look to that that kingdom that was promised to them he says therefore okay since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses all those saints that came before us let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us and he says let us run with patience the race that is set before us okay, that was their race they ran it well and they finished well now let us run our race with patience and look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, the one who begins our good work in us and the one who completes it, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, what was the joy set before him? Us, his church, his bride, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. That means he, he thought nothing of the shame, of his nakedness, of his torment, of his the disrespect that it was shown to him. He despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He says, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Remember, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin.
be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Remember, we're going to experience hard things in this life, but we're not living for this life. We're not gonna get everything we want in this world, but we're not living for this world. We're living for the, the world that is to come and we're living in this world in his power on behalf of the people that are around us that we might bring many friends with us to that eternal kingdom that we're waiting for.